it's Sunday again and here I am live. Now, hopefully uh, the sound is all right. <laughs> if you're there, um, hello. <laughs> um, if you're there, let me know if you can't hear. You should be able to. I think the sound is, well, I've set the sound up high, so you should be all right. And it's a very bright, sunny day here in Shropshire. And almost too bright, but we do have some wind, so that's keeping us a bit cooler. But no rain yet, no rain at all. So today, that's actually going to be quite relevant because I've been very busy. Um, well, now for months actually since March, very busy in the garden. Um, if you're out there, if anybody's out there, can you tell me whether you can hear me all right and that everything's okay? Because apparently last week it all got a bit off. But it should be okay now. Let me just double check on that. Yeah, it's 100%. So we should be all right. Hi there. Yeah, uh, hi Joe. Uh, can you hear me all right, Joe? Is the sound okay this week? So um, I've, I'm sort of fussing about it after last week. <laughs> but there we go. Okay, right. Well, as I said, this is about talking to gardens. Uh, so one of my favourite books is called Talking with Dragon or Talking to Dragons. And um, so this is Talking to Gardens, and it's sort of a bit similar to Talking to Dragons in many ways. But uh, hi there, hi Raven, and um, yeah, and uh, oh yeah, we're all right. Yeah, sounds okay. Thank you. Now I can relax. I'm a bit panicky. <laughs> okay, so gardens. I've been gardening all my life. Um, my witchy uncle Purse, um, Percival Purse, um, taught me uh, along with dad and also another witchy man, cunning man as we call them. And they both talk to the, their plants. And this is way, way back um, in the 1950s and 60s before it, it sort of got popular and before the new age sort of headed in and decided. Yeah, we should all talk to plants. Yes, we should. Absolutely right. So I got into the habit. And that's really a lot of what it's about. It's about getting into the habit of talking, talking with everything. So, I mean, that carries on a bit from last week where I was saying working with spirit. But it carries on, really, um, because talking to your garden, talking to your plants is still talking to spirit. And it's about getting into the habit of doing it and doing it all the time. And another thing is, it's sort of, yeah, an attitude of mind. An attitude of mind that says, I can talk to everything. It will hear me and it will answer me as I was saying last week. And gardens do. Plants are sentient beings. I mean, even science is sort of agreeing with that nowadays. And actually it's good because it's reminding us of what we should or did already know, that plants are sentient and they do know. If you've met, read that lovely um, book, The Hidden Life of Trees, by that marvellous German forester, um, if you haven't, read it. Uh, that will tell you an awful lot about the social life of, of plants. I mean, in his case, it's trees, but it covers it covers the whole plant kingdom. And so they're not inanimate objects. They are there and real and part of us. And it's not a new discovery that talking to plants works. I mean, um, back in the 70s, it was all like, oh, Prince Charles talks to plants, it's wonderful, you know, we must all talk to plants. And there were loads of experiments, little, little sort of personalised experiments going on to, to show that music helps and 
talking to them helps and the tone of your voice helps and if you shout at the plant it really does go Ooh! and it is quite fascinating and we were very much involved in all that and we used to um, do talks and demos and things at the early mind body spirit festivals and that was all over them it was lovely and people were really going wow they do yeah they can then it all seems to have got a bit forgotten and we were all just hippies and we just sort of did it and you know real people don't do that um yeah we do real people do that we talk we talk to everything so i was talking to my garden and i've been talking to it all week now i seem to be being led into I check on my notes again a minute so i seem to be led, in, led straight into somewhere i thought i wasn't going until a few minutes you know in a, a few minutes time but it seems like I'm going there now. So, what happened? Well, as you know, I've been here since only since August, and the garden was incredibly neglected and overrun and um, unhappy and full of things that really didn't want to be there. So, a lot of the winter was about clearing those out, and then the spring has been about putting the beds and things together. And I always sit with things before I start and ask them what they want and do this. And I was doing this last August, September time, and getting the basic plans out for the garden. And they've worked. It's, it's working. It's coming along. They've grown and changed a bit as we go along, but that's normal. That's what plans do. But there's one bit that I've been sort of sitting there, and I usually go and sit up by the pond and... Um, I just discovered this about an hour ago that I can actually share screens on this, but I can't at the moment because I don't know what I'm doing. So I might get brave and try it in a minute. I was like, show you a picture. Um, but we'll try and then I'll see if I can do that next time. But I'm, there I was sitting up by the pond with a cuppa, having a break from some pretty heavy duty weeding stuff and planting. And I was. I looked down at what we call the south hedge. I, it's the hedge on the south side of the garden. So the hedge bit that I look at is actually facing north. So it's a bit shady. It's, it's not sunny. The other side of it is brilliant sunshine, but this my side is a bit shady. And it's a tall holly hedge. It's lovely. And it's oh, probably a metre thick, if not more, a bit more. And so it's absolutely superb for the birds and for the wildlife and insects love it as well. And it's got ivy growing through it. And so the evergreen means it's a really good winter habitat. It's also really good for me because we get um, southerlies, southwesterlies and westerlies. And all around that side of the garden, we have this huge thick holly hedge. So I get quite a lot of shelter from that. It's brilliant. Anyway... In the bottom of it grow nettles. Now, I don't actually have a thing against nettles. It also grows stocks. I mean, they always grow together. We know why. Stick, get a sting, rub your finger, rub the sting with dock leaf, and it does go away. But they like the same sort of ground, and they work the same sort of ground. And soil that's had nettles in it is superb. It comes up, it's beautiful tilt, once you get the nettle roots out. Um, otherwise, all you get is more nettles. But here, down in the bottom of the south hedge, I've got no objection to the nettles growing there. And I need them anyway, because they're food for red admirals and tortoiseshells and peacocks and another type. There are a couple of types whose names I can't remember. So if I want those butterflies, I've got to make sure their caterpillars have something to feed on. Great, so there they are. They're doing a good job. And I like dock flowers as well, and I love the sort of reddy brown and the, the tall stems and that. That's pretty. But it's still very green and you know, just one colour. And I would really like a bit more variety, and I would like a bit more colour in that hedge. And I don't know what to do with it. And I, I did not want to start digging it and turning it into some kind of posh border. So there I was, and I sort of looked at the hedge, and I said, well, come on, then, help me. Tell me what to do. What, what can I plant in amongst nettles? What will grow and be fine and not, not be swamped by the nettles, but will you know, 
a bit butch and push its way through and come up as well. <laughs> Almost instantly, I got the answer. So I'm obviously in the right time. We'll go into that in a minute. So, what have I got? So if I pop them here, put the list down for you in case you want to make a note of it. So, amongst my nettles in the shady patch, or you know where it's shared shadowed, I got the list. And with the nettles I can, and the docks, I can have mint, cat mint, honeysuckle. I was a bit surprised at that, but okay, it'll climb the hedge and it will flower from the top. And that's fine, and that will help the bees and the insects. There's another flower for them. Oxeye daisies. Wouldn't normally have thought of those, but I thought, yeah, okay, out of it, why not? And they just cope with anything and they take over anything. Oak grass. Well, the garden's already full of this beautiful oak grass. Again, I'll, I'll get my act together next week and be able to share screen and show you some pictures. But um, it's beautiful. It's about uh, maybe a metre tall, maybe not quite. And it's got these beautiful long heads that dangle and sway and it really is gorgeous. So the whole, if it's all along there, the whole thing will sway and, and flow like a wave. So that was really good. Um, along with that salvia. Well, I should have a lot of the lovely native purple salvia that, I mean, that pushes its way through stones. I mean, it used to push its way through paths in my last garden. So that would cope. Comfrey. I've already got some comfrey up there, but I could do with some more. Low, so I'm going to bring that out more to the front. So that was a really good idea, and I love the, the flowers of it, it's really beautiful. And this isn't the bopping 14, the horrible purple job, um, which just takes over the garden by itself. This is the old native, um, uh, Symphytum, I can't remember, <laughs> should be able to do this anyway. The native comfrey and um, foxgloves, of course. Got some. I think I brought some uh, yielding plants with me. So I'm just going to go and hunt them now. Forage. Got loads of that. Hyssop. I don't think I've got any. Um, did have, but I don't think I brought any with me. So I may have to grow that over the winter for it. And it also said that it may well take some big, tough shrub roses. Not masses, but two or three. Um, and that will, where at the moment it's sort of flat, that will sort of, come in and out and come in and out and that makes it so much nicer and not only will this be for looking at from the pond which is a good way away but it faces the, the bottom half of that hedge faces the house wall on the south side which is our front door and I'm turning turning that into a lovely little lawn where we sit um it's very sunny so Paul really likes it because he likes the sun and I can only do it in the spring or in the evening um, but we can sit there, so you've got the lawn and buttercups and daisies and things, and then this wildlife hedge which will sort of flow in and out to you. So, I was pretty thrilled. I've been waiting, what is it, 10 months now? To see what the answer would be for that. And every time I try, um, hi everybody, I'm getting more people, hi Pam, hi Amanda, um... Every time I get near it and to think of doing it, I get you know, go that way, and I'm told to do something else. So when I'm not told, I just find that my brain and my I find my feet walking me to a different bed, and I start working on that. So what I'm trying to say is that by this asking thing and listening and waiting. I'm getting to do things at what the garden says is the right time. Now, the garden is part of Mother Earth, obviously. And um, I was wondering if I'd get any cards for what I'm going to talk about today. Cause, you know, I don't normally have garden cards. Anyway, nearly immediately, this is from uh, John Matthews' shaman, well, well, shaman's pack. Celtic Shaman's Pack with Jessica Potter's drawing. And what I got was this one. Let's get the lights on now. Well, 
Lady of the Sacred Earth, of course, silly me. For us, um, in our way from Britain, that's Rhiannon, hence the white horse that she rides. Well, several of them ride white horses. And she is the Lady of the Sacred Earth. And gardening, I'm actually working with her, playing with her. So I thought, yeah, it's a reminder. And it takes me into another thing. Right, no, no, I need to go stay there first. So I didn't, wasn't the only card I got. I also got, and this is sort of fairly obvious as well, the woman made from flowers, Blodias, the spirit. Um, I do a good tale of her uh, in, in, uh, on the website. <laughs> And it's her story, and she is a spirit who has made a body to help a couple of the gods, which she did. And the list of flowers is easily available on Google, and it comes from, largely nowadays, from Robert Graves' work. Well, woman made of flowers, yes. And in more than one way, actually, because here she is, and... In a sense, by gardening, I'm making her body. I'm making a woman made from flowers. Um, and she's different every time, and I do this whenever I garden. We all do. Every one of us, we don't do it knowingly, but we do. So she's there as part of the spirit, and she's a real changer and mover um, and a shifter, and she, in the story, she teaches blue to grow up and to stop messing about and being an idiot kid um, but grow up and start being the guardian of the land because he becomes a king and that's what a king is for us is the guardian of the land the guardian of the goddess the body of the goddess so, yeah nice one and so I'm there talking but not directly to them. They're huge. They're vast. You know, I mean, they're cosmic scale. And, yeah, they know about my garden, but for goodness sake, they've got a lot of other things to do. They don't need to be, you know, with me, gardening all the time. So, <clears throat> what I'm actually really, really talking about is the spirit of place. All gardens have a spirit. Your garden has a spirit of place. It really does. And it like like all spirits, they actually like being talked with. They like to talk with us and they like being talked with by us. And because we're new boy on the block, we're humans, we're, <clears throat> we're not old. I mean, this lady with... Our Earth is 4.67 billion years old. Mind-bogglingly old. She's been making her planet for 4.6 or 7 billion years. Frankly, I think she's actually got a bit of a handle on it. I think she knows what she's doing. And... All the things we're learning from climate change are definitely telling us that we don't know what we're doing. Um, we get a bright idea, um, you know, like the boys, like, I can do that job, I can do that job. And we think, oh, I'll put some um, pilly bomb pom weed on it and it'll work and that'll cure everything. Mm. It may cure the immediate problem that was fussing us. But it probably wipes out and completely imbalances and messes up everything else around it. Oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, that's bold. And we're very much bold at the moment. We're not thinking. We think, that's the problem. I'll find a silver bullet and I'll fix it. No, you won't. This is an interlocking, fantastic mechanism, body, planet. And it all works together. So we need to learn to work with it. And part of that working with 
is to speak to the first place. Um, have you noticed something? I'm saying speak with, talk with, not talk to, but talk with. When you, you have to be careful with words, with all of magic, you know. Anyway, if when you talk to something, it tends to think that you're talking down to it, that you are somehow thinking yourself to be superior. You're not. Like I said, she's been around, they've all been around for hundreds of millions of years. Humans have been around for perhaps five million. That's it. Huh. In planetary terms. We are newborn on the block. We don't know very much, and we need to learn. And in all shamanic work all over the planet, we learn by learning from our elders. As I learned from Uncle Purse and Dad in the garden, they were my elders. They knew actually what they were doing pretty well. And you know, they grew lovely plants and lovely spaces and food to eat and all this stuff. So I learned from them and I learned a lot by hanging around with them and asking questions. So what you need to do is to contact your spirit of place. No, I thought I'd go spirit of place. I haven't. Contact your spirit of place and say, mm, excuse me, um, we'd like to do something with the garden. Uh, what do you think would be a good idea? And then just See what happens. See what pictures and images come in front of you. And you may get fired off to do something else. You know, you may get fired off to make curtains and you find out later that it was a good idea because it's a draft um, instead of gardening. But you, sooner or later, you will come up and they will give you the answer as they've given me the answer for my sat hedge, which is what the plants are nettles. So we learn to talk to the spirit of place. And we don't let ourselves be put off that this is superstition or any of the gas things that came out of the age of enlightenment, or age of endarkenment, I call it, but there you go. Um, out of all that, where what we know, like talking to plants and talking to animals and sensing into things and feeling things, all that stuff that we do know inside was discounted, that's superstition, that's just for stupid sav savages. Well, actually, there are no stupid savages. There probably aren't that many savages except up in the city. But, so we need to go away from that. We need to get out of that box and not listen to what loads of guys who've got alphabet soup after their names, authority figure types, tell us. They probably don't know, and they probably get so didactic and officious about the whole thing because they're actually scared because they realise deep down inside not they don't listen to that voice they realise deep down inside what they don't know so we learn to ask and we learn to talk with and we learn to talk with our elders and our elders some of our elders are plants not some other ones as well but some of them are plants and the spirit of place of our garden is its guardian spirit, the one that sort of holds it and helps it, and works with all the little dandelion spirits and rose spirits and vegetable spirits and the little animals that live in there as well, and the insects and the birds and the nettles and everything. And each of those has spirits, but they're sort of looked after very gently and carefully, like the grandmother that I mentioned last week by the guardian spirit of place. And we need to get there and we get there. Ah, yes. How much notice do you actually take of your soil? I mean, it's little granules. It's also a great it's the thing that holds and guards your plants. Unless you've got one of those weird air-growing plants, but I doubt it in this climate. 
So we're not only talking to the plants, we're also talking to the soil. What do you need? Do you need some muck? Do you need to be turned? Do you need watering? Do you need this? So you learn to talk to that as well. So that also is part of the whole garden and something that is being cared for by the garden spirit, the garden guardian spirit. And you can discuss, you know, your watering regimes, your planting regimes, what seeds to sow, what will grow here and there. All of that, discuss it with your, gar with your guardian spirit, with your garden guardian spirit. Now, the garden spirit doesn't only take care of the garden. It actually takes care of you too. And you don't notice, so you may not have noticed that much, because you only then you do. But it does. And it works away even when it's completely neglected and ignored, as it is probably by most people nowadays. But, you know, if it's a human that you're working with, and somebody's nice to you, it's really good to be nice back to them, to say hi, to what, what, how are you doing, uh, anything you need, can I help you with anything, what would you like to do? All of this kind of thing, it, it comes naturally between two people. So to try and bring that to come naturally with spirit, any spirits, all spirits, with your garden spirit. So I'm here now, now. I really like to do this. What do you think of that idea? Uh, I've never actually had the guardian spirit say rubbish to me. It's come close a couple of times. Really? I wouldn't do that. What about? And you go, forget about that. So that was sort of like a good reminder. Um, like a bad place to plant something or put something or whatever. And you do get told like a friend. And once you start doing that, it really makes a difference. Now, um, 20 years ago, ish 15 years ago, I trained as a garden designer um, at Pershaw College, which is very good, very nice, good, good, good times. And um, I also did three gardens at the Royal Horticultural Society Hampton Court show uh, three summers and got medals for them and all that. But I didn't stay long doing the job. Now, this is because, you know, you get asked to make a you know, big, they see something you've done, you know, like when they show gardens or maybe they've seen pictures of your own garden or something. And they say, oh, would you make me a garden? And you go, what do you need? Blah, blah, blah. And you get your all the admin baloney. Um, and then you, your first job always is to sit down with them and talk with them. What, what are they thinking of? What, is they, what do they mean? What sort of ideas have they got? But being me, <laughs> awkward, I always also sat down. They didn't notice me doing it, but I would also be with the garden spirit. You know, so you've got, like, the plants are over there, and they're chatting away. And then over here, just beside you, you've got the garden spirit. And so you're talking away with the clouds. Blah, blah, blah. And inside me, uh, must be schizoid or something, and there's me going, what do you think of that idea? And sometimes they get, hmm. Mm. Well, very often I was getting, mm, have I got to? And so I would try and lead them into the things that the garden wanted to do. And sometimes you'd get some say yes. But I never got somebody, not then, 15 years ago, um, who would really come with and do what the garden wanted to do. So I just couldn't do it. I can't go in there and organise and do planting plans and cultural design and all this kind of stuff um, on the garden. And the gardeners are going, oh, 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 oh. And I just can't do it. So I'm not a garden designer. It's not a professional one. Not anymore. So 
what has actually happened is I find that I'm doing this right now. And also very much of my students that um, most people, in fact, I don't think I've ever had anybody who comes to be a student of mine who wasn't at least interested in plants and had a little bit of a garden or sometimes a big garden and a couple of people I know have had farms. Um, but they're all interested in it and they want to know more. And fairly soon they get this idea of working with, working with the natural world. Well, yes, you are, and you are in the physical, very much. But you're also working with its spirit. And like most people, I think all shamanic people, our people, knew that everything was animistic. Well, we were animistic. Everything has anima. Everything has spirit. So, there you are, working away, and talking with, and discussing what is actually going on in your garden, what it wants to do. I've always been very keen on my own version of permaculture um, because I know about the mycorrhiza, the root fungus that spreads that run through the whole earth and link up all the plants together and pass food around and water around and information around. It's sort of like plant internet, but it's that's got its own spirit too, that is alive. Um, I'll, I've not been that keen on, I mean I will dig. And I do, and there are times when you need to, but this continuous digging, like the continuous ploughing of so much land nowadays, which is absolutely killing it, because you're wrecking the mycorrhiza. I don't want to do that in my garden. So, in that sense, I want to build a forest garden here. And um, we're starting. I've got that's the north hedge, which I've just put in, and that is flowering and some fruiting plants. And what else can I take? Well, I was looking through seeds this spring, uh, late winter. What should I have? What should I do? I was on a vegetable seed day. And I found um, in what was called the organic seed catalogue, um, the seeds for the original Peruvian little tomato vine that... All, the, all our modern tomatoes come from. And then you produce little wee cherry tomatoes like that. But it is a vine, uh, which our modern tomatoes, or the corn ones, sort of are. And it grows in Peru, and it grows at umpteen thousand feet through a snow-clad winter, and it's a perennial plant. And we're like, ooh. Well, if it can cope with a Peruvian winter, and it copes with, it's, so it seems that it copes with almost anything. If it can cope with that, then it will probably cope with a Shropshire winter. Give it a go. And I've got some seeds um, from it, and um, I'm growing the little tomatoes, and I'll, I'll get this one shared screen thing sorted and get things sorted next week. But um, I'll bring you, because they're only we at the moment, they should be a little bit less we next week. And I've got them growing. So where am I going to put a permanent perennial tomato? You know, you don't stuff up your canes and your corns or your wigwams or whatever. It needs to grow somewhere. And what would it grow on in the wild? So I was getting pictures of the Peruvian forest with a lot of plants. And clambering around bushes and trees and things. Oh, you could go with that. And the other half of that would be good is that the north hedge is very thick, like it's about three meters deep. Um, and again, it's all sort of wavy like that. But being a north hedge, it faces south. And it doesn't get shaded by the other hedge because it's a slope. And it will really get the sun. So if I have this little tomato plant on some of the forward bushes, 
That should be rather good. So one of the other cards that came up was this one. Whoops, wrong way. I'm not that brilliant at backing either, but there we go. Um, the Woodward. Now the Woodward is the man of the forest, the lord of the forest. Or one of the versions of, he is the trees, he is the plant, he is the animal. He is the wildness of it. Not the wild man, but he is the wood ward. And the ward is something that takes care of, again. So we're talking about the spirit of the woods and the guardian spirit of the woods. So he was actually helping me with this whole idea with the tomatoes. And he's also putting other ones in my head too, but I haven't got those worked out yet, so we're still going to have to play with that. So what I'm saying, isn't it interesting how the garden comes back and you've got your own garden spirit, who's sort of like a member of, well, you're a member of their family. But over, overall, you've got these other figures who've got much wider um, overall guardianship. And they do notice you. And they come in to help as well. And as the climate changes, which years quite noticeably so we need to adapt to what we can eat and can grow and certainly very much what we can grow ourselves so we need to contact people like the woodward in fact really we need to contact all of these people but through our guardian garden spirit there's no need to go banging on the boss's door there are people you know, closer to your home, closer to you, who will be able to help you immediately. But you will be working with the ideas that the Woodward brings to you. The ideas that the woman made of flowers brings to you. And remember, flowers are important for vegetables. Most Nothing grows unless it grows into a flower. It must need to do that. So even if it's your spinach and you don't want it to bolt, but it's going to have to flower sooner or later and you won't get any more spinach seeds if it doesn't. So you need her. And of course, overall, you need her. We have to work with the Lady of the Sacred Earth with our gardens. But we don't need to be knocking directly on her door every time. We can learn to be more competent in that, and more confident as a result. We can become co-workers, and there are loads of those, including, of course, your garden spirits, your squirrels, your plants, and the cabbage spirits, and the dandelion spirits, and the nettle spirits, and the foxglove spirits, and the rose spirits, and the willow tree spirits, all of them. And each will help you. And as you get more practiced at this, you'll be able to contact the relevant one for what it is you're doing now. And if you don't, if you can't work out anything else, the easiest thing, and I do it quite often, is I go out into the garden and say, Help, I've got this problem, guys. Will you send somebody to just give me a couple of words of advice? Dunk. There it is. That's years of practice. So, the sooner you all get some years of practice, the better. <laughs> and honestly, it's fun doing it. But I got one other card as well today, which I think is important for us to, to consider. The green and burning tree. Well, as part of the pack, it has a lot of meanings about transitions and walking between the worlds and this sort of thing. But right now, for me, it just went wallop when I was looking through the cards earlier. I don't know how it is where you are, but we haven't really had any rain since March. April, May, two whole months. 10 weeks, 12 weeks. Q4, 
plants need water. Yes, we got flooded out last winter. And that actually killed a lot of things because it drowned quite a lot of my plants. Was the ground was just not able to take it. But now they're all growing and now they're in the spring. And of course, a lot of my garden at the moment is newly planted because I only bought it last year. And some of it I've actually only just planted this year. And then, of course, there's the vegetables, which I've only been working, you know, been in the ground since sort of February, March time. They're all new and they need water. There isn't any. Planted out my beans last night. And um, the soil is dust. And this is my good vegetable garden. But I put lots of muck in already and it's still like dust. And you water it and you find the water's only gone down about that much. I think before I came, nobody had mucked this garden. A muck manure, if you're not getting that one. Um, manured the garden. And I don't know how much compost they'd put in it. Have a look at the previous tenants' compost bin, and mm. I don't think I would have put a lot of that on it. She's she wasn't very careful, and <laughs> to be honest, um, the one thing you find in the soil when you're digging in this garden is plastic clothes pegs and plastic children's toys. So frankly, oh, and she she did mulch quite a bit with coal. Have I never done that before? Anyway. It hasn't really been cared for, it hasn't been mucked. It, I gather she used it to grow vegetables, but you need to put the goodness back in if you're going to take the goodness out to eat yourself. Because in, in nature, it normally just cycles automatically, the, the fall of the leaves <coughs> and everything like that. If you're going to pull them all up and eat the leaves and eat the roots, then you need to put muck back in. Um, good garden compost and good manure, and you do need it. Um, other things to put in. But it hasn't been, so my soil is not good. <coughs> I'm also living as a, as, a, as a little wee baby mountain, edge of a, edge of a valley kind of thing. And the soil, there is not much topsoil. It's very, very rocky, stony ground. So I need to bin, build it up. And at the moment, because we're getting this. I'm not getting the green tree. I'm afraid of getting the burning tree. At the moment we're not. At the moment everything is going all right. I am watering frantically, um, you know, hose pipe every day, because otherwise things won't grow and they won't survive. But we need to think about this. The world is in the pandemic. C19 pandemic. But we're also getting this. We're also getting, look, look what you've done to the planet as well. And look, you may be killing the plants. And you've got to learn better. So I was getting that this morning when I was out in the garden doing some stuff. And I think it's really, really important. And it's again part of speaking to the spirits and speaking to your guardian garden and asking, asking, what do you need me to do now? What do you need me to give you? What do you need me to get? And it's all about working with, being a co-worker with spirits. So you don't know everything. But they can't do some of the things that you can do. So you need to do them. And it's about the whiz is about not imposing and not letting your ego say, Oh I want so and so, you know, I'm going to grow um, a camellia in totally alkaline soil. No, you're not. Um you have to get over that one and sort of get out get over yourself <laughs> just afraid. And you really do. Because when you're working with, you're sharing. It's real, real sharing with other world. And it's a wonderful place to be. And it helps you all through the whole of your life. And people who are sort of worried and 
lonely and upset and all that sort of thing about um, being in lockdown and co for the COVID thing. If you're really in touch with spirit, you're not. You may think, oh, you know, I was about to walk so and so. Um, but you're not alone. You are never alone when you've learned, when you begin to learn how to work with spirit. And you work with all life, not just plants. I mean, consider your table. I mean, I've just got a, my table here is made of wood. It was a plant, and it still is has a spirit. It also has a table spirit because now it's doing the job as a table. And it's actually holding up my laptop and all this kind of thing. Um, and it has a spirit. Um, what else have we got? Um, well, the drums behind me you would obviously know they do. But everything does. And it all has stuff to teach you. And you learn to work with all of it and share with all of it. You know, even with spiders or snakes or things that you don't you know, you learn to work with them. And it really helps expand your envelope. I know it expands mine every day. I'm always learning something. I'm always saying, Oh god, I didn't like that. Oh, I didn't know I could do that. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, as I find something, because I'm open to it. I'm not saying, oh, you can't look like that. You know, the entire lot that way. You can only do this that way. And no, I can't do that. That's it. What else can I do? Actually, being a cripple is really helpful for that. When you've got a pair of claws like this. <laughs> if there's any things that are probably really easy for those of you who have hands, and for those of us who don't have hands, you'll think, how am I going to do that? You work away. You'll find it. And this is really what magic is about. The sh working with. The sharing. And it's fun. And you learn a lot. And you learn things you never even thought you were going to learn. And you didn't even know you could learn. And you're always doing it, always growing, always changing. And that's what magic is about. Well, I'm going to shut up now. It's time for you all to go off and have a cup of tea, and for me to go off and have a cup of tea. And then I think I'm probably out in the garden again, <laughs> doing something or another. And I will try and get that share screen thing together for next week. So I look forward to seeing you all next Sunday, same time, same place, wear a red carnation or whatever it is. See you next Sunday, people. Bye.